So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment. And you should all see me. Um, so this is the uh, next talk in our virtual seminar series, uh, sponsored by CompSusNet with support from National Science Foundation and Cornell University. My name is Doug Fisher. I'm the director for Outreach, Education, Diversity, and Synthesis of CompSusNet. Um, and today I am presenting on uh, something of an overview of activities in CompSusNet um, that is, oh, let's say an expansion or modification of a talk I gave at this past AAAI on computational sustainability. Um, so before launching into my talk, I just want to mention a talk next week um, by uh, Alan Fern. Uh, let's see if we can share that. And are you seeing my presentation slide up now? And are you seeing the poster for Alan's talk next week? Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from Carla. Great job. So um, tune in um, in two weeks, two weeks, I should say. Um, you can find the full schedule of talks um, at this uh, URL, as well as a, um, a lot of other resources like, um, uh, like the uh, network blog, um, publications, um, as well as um, recordings of, of the uh, past presentations that we've had. Um, so let me start in. And this is going to be a what I hope is an interactive talk. Um, throughout the talk, I've got uh, questions posed uh, that um, you are all uh, welcome to uh, chime in. So I prompted you uh, if um, if uh, you don't want to uh, interrupt me. Christiane um, would prob will probably give me a um, uh, flag me if uh, something comes up. Uh, so let's. Uh, Let's start, um, let's start the, the presentation. I'm gonna go ahead and, are you seeing um, a slide view now? Yep. Presentation view, fantastic. And I'm gonna turn this a bit so the people in this room can see it. So again, this was a, um, this is a, a modification of a, um, a talk I gave at um, uh, this past AAAI. Um, and I opened with uh, the statement from Carla, uh, just describing what uh, computational sustainability is. Um, it's really at the nexus of computing and sustainability with goals to develop new computational models, methods, and tools uh, to balance these many factors involved in the sustainable future. Um, I think computing for computational sustainability um, just as we view, I think, computing, in particular artificial intelligence, I think we have two perspectives of it. Uh, one is a tool-based perspective. Uh, it is a collection of tools that we would be used in a partnership with uh, human decision makers. They would use these tools for analysis of data and um, uh, together with uh, um, uh, bringing together a number of factors. Um, this falls into the um, cognitive uh, prosthesis perspective, I think, of uh, Ford, Glymore, and Hayes. Um, and there's a second paradigm, which I think is, we don't think about enough, um, although it's old AI, good old fashioned AI, and that's the agent perspective. Uh, and increasingly, uh, I am thinking more about computational sustainability in terms of this uh, agent perspective. Um, I've been doing this for a while. I, I guess I didn't get too much of my own background, but I served at National Science Foundation for three years and um, was the uh, size representative for uh, sustainability and did a number of things there, including being involved in the um, development of uh, the SEAS initiatives. But um, uh, I can remember a workshop I went to three days after starting, and they uh, asked me, um, what I was uh, went around the room and talked about what we were interested in in terms of uh, um, 
integrative uh, artificial intelligence. And I, I basically said a, um, uh, a planetary wide environmental consciousness. And I thought it was a bit out of the box, but people came up to me afterwards, one in particular who I won't name, um, but a well-known artificial intelligence researcher said, I've been thinking about exactly the same thing. So I think we want to think about how we integrate the various tools that we study as well. Um, and I think a good mechanism for doing that is think about how these uh, tools integrate uh, within a, a cognitive architecture, for example. Um, and I recall that this idea of general discussions about artificial intelligence and, and what we might do there has come up in, in our seminary series, uh, seminar series before, and so I've been inviting them to uh, interrupt and, and we can talk about that somewhat. Um, these are exemplar projects in computational sustainability. These are taken off the uh, web page of CompSusNet. Um, they just are intended to give a flavor of the projects that are, are going on. There is a, um, oops, there is a, um, in materials discovery, there's a, a, a what is being done in the, in the application domain. There's a motivation, why are we doing it? And then there is a how component that talks about the computational methods that are used to uh, address those projects. And again, these are just exemplars in materials discovery, uh, big data, sensing big data uh, in Africa, green security games and uh, landscape uh, conservation. We can talk about any of those in more depth. Um, this virtual seminar series you obviously know about, but this is something that I uh, told the uh, group at AAAI about uh, very quickly. Um, when I gave the talk at AAAI, I wasn't actually sure I was going to fit it in within the um, requisite time, so I just listed some spoilers that um, I wanted to make sure they took away whether I got to it uh, or not. But I've talked about this idea of AI cognitive architectures perhaps being a platforms for synthesizing across what we might think of as currently disparate uh, computational sustainability uh, technologies. Um, there's some underrepresented areas of study in computational sustainability, I think, both within CompSusNet and generally. Um, and I put a, I've added a be thinking about this because there'll be some prompts for us to talk about what we might think we would want to add to the computational sustainability uh, landscape uh, later. Um, but I mentioned to natural language processing, integrative intelligence, um, as well as a um, sustainability area like cradle to cradle design and how AI and computing might be used to manage that. Um, and then methodological concerns that I think AI are, is particularly good at, um, uh, perhaps particularly good at um, informing, which is uh, projection of uh, unanticipated consequences, because unanticipated consequences are not the same thing as unanticipatable consequences. Um, I'd like, um, at the end, you'll have a, a chance to talk about challenges. Um, challenges is something I think are worthwhile to think about. Uh, one challenge that, uh, challenge problem that I would advocate um, or forward is, uh, that's consistent with the uh, uh, a focus on integrative intelligence would be AI composed environmental impact reports um, in whole or part. And then we'd be talking about uh, education, particularly undergraduate and graduate materials uh, later on as well as uh, research. Um, I gave something of a history of computing and sustainability um, because uh, since uh, since the beginnings of computing, it's been used for, um, uh, for sustainability problems. Um, climate modeling is one of the earliest. Uh, and I love this quote, to be sure the computer at Philip's disposal was as primitive as the dishpan. It's ram hill all of five kilobytes. But this was one of the first uh, climate models. Um, I would also say uh, transportation modeling uh, is an early application of computing. Transit 7F was a well-known package for agent-based modeling in, in transportation. Uh, wildlife conservation and planning has gone back a ways. Um, and I think in the area of social computing, 
Um, and I think particularly, you know, given current events, um, um, I'm getting more and more interested in uh, discourse. It's both civil as well as consequential. So the results of discussion between uh, people at, uh, at, of different um, um, uh, political bents should be should result in something uh, that is substantial. It shouldn't just be a thumbs up and emoji on Facebook. But I love this um, uh, this quote from um, uh, about Axelrod's work on um, um, looking for uh, rules that. Um, uh, encourage cooperation, that the future must cast a sufficient shadow on the present uh, is an insight that I think um, is particularly relevant in uh, sustainability and getting us to think ahead about the consequences of what it is we're doing now. Um, you know, when I applied to National Science Foundation, I was asked to give a, a job talk. It was the first job talk I'd given in 20 years. And uh, one of the things I talked about was sustainability um, and AI's possible applicability for climate change and sustainability. And there wasn't too much out there. Um, and what I did find um, seemed to be concentrated in uh, Europe, um, as well as using technologies that I think sometimes we give short shrift to, like um, genetic algorithms were being used as approaches for optimization. And they may be imperfect for some things, but uh, they were the hammer that people were using to address sustainability problems in those early days, uh, particularly in Europe. But these are some of the projects I'd come across that were present when I gave that uh, job talk. Um, I believe it was uh, Tom was one of the leaders as well as um, some others, um, or at least participants in that uh, group at the bottom, Machine Learning for the Environment Working Group. Um, so these were activities going on um, before um, uh, um, CompSust um, uh, started or was labeled, but um, I think it's important to recognize those and uh, because we're going to be, we want to reach out to um, some of those individuals and make sure we, uh, I think, bring them in. Uh, one thing that I was aware of and made aware of at the uh, National Science Foundation when we were looking at it's, it's um, colored my thinking about sustainability throughout is um, recognizing the higher order effects of computing. <coughs> um, and there are various uh, pointers there about the, uh, um, the potential second and third order effects of, uh, of computing. Um, if you read the Kohler and Erdman paper, for example, you're likely to read about uh, pervasive computing in fashion, um, which is becoming increasingly, I think, um, of interest. I think at the last computational sustainability conference, there was at least one person there who was interested in that. But the questions they ask is, what about recycling? Are we going to be able to, is it going to be easier or hard to recycle the computing devices, sensing devices that are embedded in in uh, clothing or fabrics. Those, I think, are important things to talk about. Um, and then, of course, recent uh, computing for computational sustainability. Um, the um, uh, first expeditions award in the area to uh, uh, Carla and uh, a, lo a, l a large number of other um, um, co-PIs or several co other co-PIs. I think Tom was one and I'm probably forgetting others. Um, uh, the following uh, following two years, another expedition in uh, Earth modeling, uh, and then CompSus Net in December 2015. Um, in addition to these, or along with these activities, I think are two. Um, I think are important um, uh, uh, advancements. One is this: the computational sustainability conferences. Um, they've been held. Um, somewhat regularly since 2008. The first one was at uh, Cornell. I was uh, lucky enough to attend that. Um, and um, uh, and uh, those are conferences dedicated to uh, work in computational sustainability. I think in some ways, though, the thing I get more excited about is the uh, special tracks 
at the AAAI in Ichikai. And these have been, these have followed a, a number of different models, but I think they represent a, a deeper kind of infusion. Uh, it's one thing to have a computational sustainability conference. It's another thing to have computational sustainability papers side by side with uh, papers that are unconcerned with sustainability per se. Um, and that deeper infusion, I think, is something that uh, is every bit as important in, um, in um, uh, making people aware of uh, the sustainability potential of um, AI and computing generally. So here's a prompt. Um, you may have some things that um, uh, you want to talk about now, or you may want to put into the chat window, um, or if if something comes up later, there's an opportunity to uh, add it later. But um, a quick prompt, is there, is there anything in the history that you think is particularly notable that, I'm, that I've missed that we should add to? Well, uh, Doug, I actually have a question that is not really about the history or et cetera, but it's something is concerning me. And given that you've been, you were at NSF, you probably can have some experience you can share. Sure. What do you think uh, the impact of the, this, uh, you know, recent decision, uh, the of in terms of you know the U.S. Uh, out of the Paris Agreement is going to uh, have, like in terms of funding, NSF funding, and or other agencies. I mean, I know this question is completely different, but I, I no, no, actually... Right. Yeah. Um, it's a good question. Um, I think in general, um, I would feel, I, I'm guessing our colleagues at NSF are feeling a bit dismayed. Um, uh, I know that um, when, uh, after the election, I was, I was worried about uh, any grant that uh, mentioned climate change or sustainability in it. But um, I, don't, I don't know that the, this withdrawal from the um, uh, Paris Accord, I, I really don't know what, what difference it will make. Um, but, sorry, interrupting. So sorry for uh, interrupting. But maybe I'm going to ask a question, a different question that I actually, you know, wonder. You know, one of the things that it is quite remarkable about the U.S. is that you know the president plays a role, but but you know there are all kinds of uh, uh, you know. Uh, 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 organizations and institutions that keep going and uh, uh, are not uh, directly affected by the opinions of the president and in fact you know we have you know a system that seems to be working pretty well and even you know after this decision there are already several you know states etc they they uh, are committed to 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 the Paris Agreement, etc. My question is how much how much independence from the president and uh, you know NSF has. I mean, or maybe I should you know how micromanage. I mean, are they micromanage indeed? Like, uh, yeah, sustainability is probably not the favorite topic for some in Washington, but. My uh, NSF, I think, has some autonomy. And uh... right, I think they they do have some autonomy. When I started serving in NSF, George Bush was the president, and um, we talked about what would happen if we got a call from the vice president. What should we do? <laughs> uh, we should go upstairs at NSF um, because I mean. Bush was not that friendly to, you know, work in, involving climate change, for example, but there was no real micromanagement. I mean, and people, I think, felt pretty, uh, program directors there felt um, um, pretty good about um, uh, the level of intervention. It was really almost no intervention that I can, that I can remember. 
um, under Bush and certainly not under Obama. Um, uh, so there was no micromanagement, but the National Science Foundation is one of the agencies that reports directly up the chain of command of the president as part of the executive branch. Um, um, I remember that, you know, and unfortunately, I think when people at NSF did worry about um, interventions from uh, Congress, uh, or even the president, and maybe the president now. Um, it was the um, it was really the social, behavioral, and economic um, directorate that um, mm -hmm. was particularly under the gun much of the time. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And um, um, I recall some hearing some information about. Uh, um, you know, one of these one 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 of these reports came out. You were, but um, uh, one of these reports came out about um, uh, the waste that um, uh, you know the wasteful proposals, the projects that were being supported at NSF. I think um, um, there was um, um, there was actually I, I heard that size was even though some size project had been implicated there. Um, there was a real backing off when it was learned that they were sized yeah. projects. There's a comment from... But, but I, I guess related to this is just the whole lack of a science advisor and what the consequences of that are. You know, that you know, with the lack of, an, uh, you know, of an appointment of a science advisor at this point. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts about that, all right? Because that just seems like it's... Uh, a kind of a manifestation, all right, of how um, science kind of fits into a lot of the decision making at the moment. Right. No, I would agree, and I, I don't. I don't really have much thought of, about that. Um, um, and I would expect our program directors to be very careful about uh, how they interact with um, outside PIs um, right now. But, um, but yeah, no, I, I have not heard anything, though, about NSF's budget being, you know, drastically cut more than, you know, than I would have, I, I would have expected more cuts. Um, but NSF has been surprisingly, so far as I can tell, out of the news. Um, other agencies have come under much greater uh, scrutiny. So, I don't uh, sorry, I guess we, uh, it was a, a bit of a, but you know, I think we are all worried about this and the French president is inviting all the scientists to move to France, so. <laughs> right. Well, I, I think it's something to. Um, <laughs> ah, Paris. Keep your eyes on. Um, but yeah, surprisingly, there was no micromanagement when I was there. That's good. Whether there will be an attempt to micromanage, I cannot imagine, you know, given what we've heard about the staffing, including the lack of a science advisor, yeah. that there will be micromanagement for a while. I mean, yeah. maybe, I don't know whether that's a savings grace, but we'll, we'll see who the science advisor who's appointed eventually Very good. is. So, yeah. No, no. Um, Anything else on that, or um, or getting back to the the history history that I'm missing? Okay, something comes up. Let's see. Oops. All right. Clearly, something is. Right, that seems better. So if you, one thing I suggested to the uh, people in the audience at um, um, AI was um, uh, the computational sustainability page on Wikipedia is, I think, um, very under, uh, under subscribed in terms of uh, authors. Uh, and it's something that uh, we as a community can do a, a better job of uh, keeping up to date. But um, 
uh, you know, we can we can tell our story there. This is this computational sustainability page is not something that I started. I'm uh, AI prof up there at the top, by the way. Um, but um, something considering the future is, is adding to these uh, computational sustainability pages and, and updating history. Another thing, um, place that you can involve yourself um, if you're interested in this, either adding to the history or adding to, we'll return to this when we get to the educational section, but uh, computational sustainability uh, wiki book. Um, as a, uh, a history component in it. Uh, Doug, yeah. could you share the slides because we are not seeing the slides. Oh, you're not, okay. Let's see. Now, <laughs> now you see. It's it's challenging to manage this interaction. <laughs> oh yeah. Huh? Ah, good. How's that? Yeah, this is actually uh, an interesting. Yeah, we should. It would be nice to populate this with cases. I mean, we could actually have the students. Uh, uh, and ourselves, you know, po populate this with with cases. So I, I haven't really looked at this for a while. Yeah, no, I think um, it's something that um, uh, with the CompSus Net grant, um, I'm able to hire uh, undergraduates who will add to this um, uh, bit by bit. Um, but this was a slide I showed um, right after the history, and I just pointed out that the computational sustainability page, which I did not start, I, I don't know who the uh, primary authors of this page are, um, um, is um, pretty, pretty limited, pretty bare bones. It talks about a very limited number of um, uh, applications there, transportation and utilities, um, and it's something we should really, as a community, take ownership of. Uh, we can't literally take ownership of it since it's Wikipedia, but uh, we can be the ones that uh, drive the um, the fleshing out of of those pages, and probably use undergraduates uh, and graduate students for that as well. Um, so again, I'll get back to this uh, laboratory companion later, but it's another place that you can go in and edit uh, and do a number of things. I talked about uh, computational sustainability as use-inspired basic research. Um, which has um, always interested me. So the idea and use inspired basic research, uh, also known as Pasteur's quadrant in the uh, top right corner of this uh, matrix, um, is research that's inspired by uh, real applications, but it is uh, research that leads to results which are uh, in principle abstractable and reusable in other contexts. So the particular application one starts with is a, maybe a driver for the, um, uh, the development of methods that can then be used uh, for, um, uh, for other purposes. Uh, and I think computational sustainability is a, a perfect example of, of that. I think what we want to show then is, is the computational abstractions that we develop to solve problems in a given application are actually uh, portable to uh, other applications as a way of demonstrating that, um, that um, generalizability. Um, there's a couple of different ways that, a um, few different ways that computing um, computational sustainability research is categorized. Um, this uh, one is a computing centric categorization scheme based on the uh, computing methods uh, that are used. And this particular one is from uh, Eaton Gomes and uh, Williams, uh, Brian Williams. Um, uh, one of the special issues of uh, AI Magazine. Um, and, you know, if we go down this list, um, it's a, I think, a, a pretty good list of computational methods that are implicated um, in um, 
in computational sustainability at work. I've added a couple of annotations here. I would add learning to vision or listening to vision um, uh, as well as uh, uh, because I think increasingly, and maybe one of the talks we'll hear in the near future, if I'm not mistaken, um, we'll get it uh, audio um, and listening technology to identify individuals um, or species and, um, and robotics as well in this space. So I'd ask you to look at this space and um, we'll be talking about um, whether there are important areas of computing that um, seem missing from the space. Um, you can just be thinking about those as we go through. Um, this is a nice abstraction, um, or visualization rather, of this idea of abstraction. And one thing that we are interested in doing and use basic, um, use driven basic research is abstraction so that we can use the same technologies across different sustainability areas or uh, other areas entirely. And so this is, um, uh, this is a visualization, if I'm not mistaken, developed by um, uh, Rich Bernstein and um, Carla, um, and it is a uh, based on a subway metaphor, where the lines uh, in this subway system are um, uh, represent uh, computational methods, and uh, the stops represent um, uh, sustainability areas. And so you can see the same methods with the same line touches uh, a number of different um, uh, sustainability areas. I think it's particularly useful. Um, we had talked about how well this would scale up and we created a interactive version with a, uh, some uh, undergraduate students that uh, worked for me earlier that um, was quite nice. So you could actually hover over a stop and you could see information about the, um, the projects within uh, that stop. And there might be multiple projects within that stop. Uh, and so each stop in this generalized interactive version would correspond to a cluster of projects. And this is something we'll try and um, uh, do and um, uh, get it online. Um, but this looks at uh, abstraction over computational methods. Carla? Yeah. You Actually, uh, you know, the, uh, thank, uh, uh, indeed, I, I, I think this is a great abstraction. And one of the things, and I assume there are several CompassNet people uh, 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 here, I, I really would like us to actually update this uh, subway line and, uh, you know, incorporate all the projects, you know, we did this and we tried uh, 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 to represent all the projects and, uh, uh, or, you know, some projects, but, uh, but uh, you know, going forward and actually uh, thinking in terms of uh, our NSF meeting in, uh, in the fall, I really would like, uh, you know, input, to, uh, and it would be great to have input and, you know, projects and other potential subway, uh, you know, other lines. Uh, we know there are several missing here, and it just becomes a little complex to, to uh, represent this, but uh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll be reaching out to you, uh, uh, it would be nice for us to update this uh, this uh, uh, um, uh, subway lines with the, the different projects. So I think you know we have a, a, a new version, and there are projects that, for example, the the Amazon project now is he going to be here, and uh, but uh, you know uh, uh, Warren, for example. Uh, do you see where you are <laughs> in, you know, this uh, subway line? So there's an economic dispatch of power generation, high renewable penetration. I, we try to abstract, you know, these are the kinds of projects that you are involved in. And this involves obviously large scale spatial temporal modeling. Okay. <laughs> Very, very creative. 
Pardon? Very creative. And uh, and large scale decision making, but you know, uh, uh, and you know, in order to obviously the projects are described at a very high level, but. Uh, you know, I see Tom Dietrich here, you know, obviously Tom D. where is that? Uh, you know, sorry, uh, there's a, one with pictures, so the Tamo project has to be here. And where is this, Rich? Do you know where the Tamo project is? No, bottom left. Tamo is the Oh, it's, yes, the very bottom left. Where? Right yeah. Oh, yeah. it's here. <laughs> So, because it is, yeah, yeah, so there's, I mean, there are many projects here that, uh, you know, involve several uh, universities and, uh, uh, you know, there's also, obviously, there's a lot of projects involving, you know, migrations, like the e-board, et cetera, and, uh, which involves, you know, OSU, um, uh, UMass, Dan Sheldon. I, I don't see Dan Sheldon here uh, it, uh, attending, maybe. But uh, yeah, so so and I, I you, as Doug mentioned, I honestly think this uh, abstraction is very important because you know because it really shows the power of computer science. And after all, we are computer scientists, and you know I remember giving these talks, and often like Vardy always asks me, "So what about computer science?" And you know this is exactly I think uh, a way of showing how. You know, yes, we are working on a variety of projects, but the common theme is really, you know, uh, computational, uh, uh, cross-cutting computational topics. And I think that's what makes computer science so powerful and computational sustainability so exciting. And, uh, and so if you have ideas and suggestions on how to, uh, you know, Further, uh, I like I like your animated version, uh, uh, Doug. So so uh, I I think it would be awesome for us to further uh, extend this network. And uh, you know, again, I know there are lines missing. Even our own, we proposed like ten lines, correct? Like uh, network science. Uh, uh, but uh, in, you know, it, it was difficult to include all the lines. But maybe we have to work on that. Any comments, Rich? No. But you know, mathematically speaking, this is a bipartite graph. <laughs> if, uh, so, so in, in in essence, we need really the the. The, the nodes and edges for these bipartite graphs. That's all we need. Right. So now, what what do you imagine? I. Oops. Sorry, I, I didn't. No, I was um, uh, ah. beeping at me again. But um, I like the you know I like the travel metaphor here. I'm just wondering whether generalizing this to a road network rather than a subway network would give us the, the freedom to scale up um, a DAG instead of a, um, um, uh, a network like this, but um, something to talk about. Um, and, you know, there are other potential visualizations as well. Um, Sustainability centric categorization looks at the sustainability areas, of course. And this is also from uh, Eaton Gomes and Williams. Um, these are the sustainability areas that uh, they looked at um, as part of their um, survey. So take a good look at those and um, imagine where we might go next. Um, you know, I'm also interested in, in uh, synthesis as uh, composition. This is a framework uh, adapted from uh, one of Tom's presentations um, about end-to-end uh, -end processing. I could have used 
you know, one of my own from my data mining days uh, way back when, um, which was uh, somewhat more complicated. But um, but this idea of of different methods are used at different points. Different computational methods are used at different points in the treatment potentially of a single family of problems in a in a domain. Um, and I think actually Angela Fuller's talk two weeks ago was uh, potentially a good example of this, where Angela was talking about um, methods that um, were used throughout what amounts to a pipeline um, um, from sensing uh, the environment to get information about the species. And I, I think Angela was using listening as well as uh, vision um, and identifying species, identifying individuals, um, and then using that information about the distribution of species for purposes of um, uh, landscape optimization. And so this is what I would call composition and it's another way of synthesizing across areas. Uh, in this case, unlike the, unlike the earlier case of um, example of using the um, um, metro rail metaphor in which we're talking about how a single comp class of computational methods can be used um, for different sustainability problems. Here we're uh, looking at how different computational methods can be used to solve holistic problems within a, a given sustainability domain. And this is another, another visualization that um, I rather like, and I, you know, I think we should, we should scale up. How do the various computational methods that we use uh, contribute to um, holistic problem solving, end-to-end uh, -end problem solving in, in, in various domains? Um, and I've added here, I, I should just point out, and I think this is particularly important, these are particularly important to, um, uh, in this day and age, is, is how do we communicate some of these results to various publics? Um, and does AI have a role in that, in that communication? So there's other surveys and collections um, involved uh, in computational sustainability. Um, uh, a couple of, um, another couple of collected uh, uh, editions do this. I've done a couple of different um, surveys of uh, computational sustainability papers in AAAI 2011 and 2016, um, in which I, I look at both uh, sustainability and uh, computing um, uh, methods. I, and I'm not entirely happy with um, uh, this use of a, a matrix, but um, um, nonetheless, it, it gets the it gets some points across about the variety of um, of um, computational methods and um, and the applications uh, for sustainability areas. Um, So, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like us to think about what are some currently underrepresented areas in computing and computational sustainability. Um, and I think for a number of reasons, uh, natural language processing, processing is one. Um, to my knowledge, we're not using natural language processing in, in any way, but I think if we're gonna, if, if the purpose of our tools is really to communicate to human analysts, about um, uh, information about uh, recommendations that should be followed. There's, there's certain technologies that I think um, we may want to look at. One is natural language processing. There's a lot of work on data-driven storytelling now, which has become, I think, very, uh, very popular. Cities are starting to actually, uh, cities are starting to use data-driven storytelling to um, communicate uh, communicate their um, their reasons for certain policies to uh, 
to their various publics. Cognitive architectures and integrative intelligence, um, I don't think it really touched. Um, and HCI, I think, is, to the extent that I can tell, is um, underutilized in computational sustainability. I mean, CHI does have a computational sustainability track, as I recall, but um, within CompSusNet, this is a, an area that uh, I think might be important. Um, we can design the best computational tools, and if analysts are not going to use them because we haven't paid sufficient attention to the um, uh, to the interface, that can be uh, that can be problematic. Doug, I um, I would like to highlight work uh, by my student Sean McGregor, who's looked at uh, building visualization tools for the forest fire application. Um, so so we specifically have done HCI work there. Oh, and, okay, uh, and visualization work to try to, but we have not done user studies yet. Uh, right. um, but but to to prov try to provide a, um, a decision making surface where multiple stakeholders can interact with our visualization optimization tools to to try to debug their understanding and debug our understanding of of the problem that we're trying to solve. So. Um, so there's that's a, a beginning, but I totally agree that uh, you know to the uh, I think maybe also uh, Stefano Ehrman uh, has been looking at some of these uh, you know uh, analytics tools from remote sense data and turning those into visual analytics tools uh, so that people so we don't just produce a poverty map for example, but we're able to then interactively support querying against that and so on. I think there's also an HCI component in uh, Milin Tambe's work, um, right? Because they they recommend surveillance pads, enforcement pads for the uh, uh, the the uh, game wardens. Right. But I believe there's some interaction there where you can uh, request changes in those and and have the optimization take that into account. Right. Good points. Thanks. And I guess the user studies will use analysts. In the forest fire, or they right? That well, we wanted to. We want to uh, get um, um, sort of stakeholders, uh, mm -hmm. so conservation groups, uh, forest managers, uh, you know, uh, just residents who live near the forest and don't like a lot of smoke in their yard. And <laughs> that, so, so the, it's. Uh, I mean, I, th I you know, for an awful lot of these uh, policy making problems, the challenge is to try to get everybody in the room and on the same page and right. try to build consensus around solutions. And I think uh, um, our tools have a, po have a potential to kind of break the traditional kind of ideological lines mm -hmm. uh, by bringing the best science to bear on the problem and helping people uh, come up with new solutions, new policy ideas that, that, that maybe can be acceptable to everyone. Right. been happening a lot without our tools in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of the recent management steps forward have come by really uh, politicians uh, shutting their mouths and instead facilitating conversations among the different parties. So, um, uh, and I think we have a role to play there too. Right. So I agree we need a lot more in that area. We're just yeah. beginning. <laughs> yeah, I, I, there are some serious games out there that, um, and gaming was my piece of computing technology that I, I would list as uh, undersubscribed right now, but um, the Chesapeake Bay game might bring 50, 60 stakeholders together to play this serious game over the course of two days. It can be farmers, fisher, fishermen, um, uh, residential um, uh, groups, um, all to play this uh, game. I mean, it's mm -hmm. yeah. Something like sixty thousand differential equations. It's it's a sizable, non-trivial model. Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I, so I guess serious games. I would I would add to that. Yes. Okay. So so I you know good points and uh, I mean related to this I think like HCI you know an area that I think plays a big role is like human computation. Uh, uh, and and obviously related to that citizen science, 
Right. You know, because a, a ton of the, uh, you know, given that we are, you know, the topic is sustainability, there are not that many funds and often, uh, um, you know, we have to rely on volunteers uh, to, you know, provide data, etc. But even at a higher level, uh, at a different level, like science, for example, I was thinking you were talking about HCI and we have, you know, been working on this phase map for material science, where at some point, even though the algorithms are now, you know, we have very, very fast algorithms, but we still feel the need to interact with the experts and you know at the uh, uh, later uh, you know at, as, as the, the the solutions get uh, you know uh, 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 fine-tuned by the algorithms we still need to to make sure that the experts can can uh, uh, you know uh, critique and uh, you know uh, uh, give feedback for, uh, in terms of the, the solution for the solvers so that we can improve that. So I, I think, you know, at the, the bigger biggest as Tom mentioned, you know, there are, you know, different levels of involvement from, uh, you know, uh, uh, users, at, uh, uh, experts, et cetera, to policy makers. And, and indeed, that is a big area that, uh, uh, is underrepresented, and uh, you know, Tom has, has its great tools. Another another area, Tom, that I like that I, is related to, you know, when you like for for uh, uh, when you have policies like for invasive species, how to uh, you know convert these policies into policies that can be. Uh, you know, uh, present it to policymakers and that they make sense. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that's a, a great topic that is also uh, uh, underdeveloped in general. Yeah, I would say that in, in our work, we have uh, failed to make any progress on that. Uh, no. <laughs> so we have generally. Because it's hard. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, I agree that this is a critical and really exciting uh, question. Uh, that relates to a lot of these other issues about explainable artificial intelligence. Um, but, uh, but in the invasive species project, we would basically dump the, a table on, our, uh, on, on the graduate student uh, who works in, in the, you know, on the invasive species side. And then she had to go through that table and we, we made a, a simple visualization of it, but, but she had to go through it and make sense of it in terms of higher level concepts. Uh, and, uh, and really, the, the papers that she published out of her thesis were all uh, reflected months of staring at the uh, optimal policies that come out of this, uh, comparing multiple policies to each other and, and trying to put them into some yeah, higher level abstracted understanding. And I think, um, there, yeah, it's a huge challenge to, to, to translate a giant table into something that's comprehensible. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of interesting because one of the earliest pieces of work in machine learning was Ross Quinlan's ID3 system, which <laughs> you know, of course you remember. Yeah. Um, and the goal of that was actually to take a giant uh, optimal chess endgame action table and convert it into a set of rules that a human could try, could understand. So we've come full circle on this, uh, uh, but we haven't made a lot of progress. So yeah, I, I'm, it's one of the things that I'm promoting you know, that I would love to see more work on it. Mm -hmm. Who is the student, uh, Tom? Uh, um, this was a, uh, uh, Majid Talagan was oh. the, my student, and he was working with a student in um, applied economics named, um, I just blank on her name, ah, uh, Kim Hall. Okay. Yeah, and, and yeah, Kim yeah, spent a long time staring at things, and yeah. Okay, All right. Um, let's see, I just want to finish up um, with a uh, couple points. Let's see. Oops. I'm just trying to, um, there we go. <clears throat> 
Um, I'm going to skip past this underrepresented areas and sustainability. We'll maybe come to it later. Um, but I want to talk briefly about, um, uh, be thinking about uh, if you think uh, there are some challenges for computational sustainability that could be good. I want to talk briefly about um, education because um, I'm pretty sure we have some people listening in that are interested in that. But a um, uh, couple papers down there on um, uh, computational sustainability in education. Uh, and in which we talk about education at at least three levels of granularity. Uh, I'll just talk about two right now. Course level uh, integration, uh, developing campus courses in computational sustainability, um, and um, component level uh, integration, where we're trying to integrate sustainability, computational sustainability problems in courses that are otherwise not about sustainability. So the AI wiki book is, um, is on that. We'll come to that in a moment. But um, uh, this is a uh, computing environment and energy uh, course that I taught uh, last year. Um, seemed very successful. Students really liked it. Uh, it was seminar based. Uh, we read um, uh, papers of various kinds, did exercises in machine learning, agent based modeling, optimization. Um, uh, this is a slide from another talk I gave at the SIGC on how one should cite um, educational content in a way that um, allows people to be cited for their educational artifacts like exercises and projects and whatnot, but that's an aside. Um, there are a number of computational sustainability courses out there. Um, at the time we did this um, analysis and wrote these papers, uh, there were uh, six that we looked at. These are the six. In all cases, these courses, they were designed for different levels of student, from sophomores through uh, graduate students, but they all involved um, uh, papers of various sorts. And we took the papers um, that were, that students read uh, we used topic modeling to identify topics across these papers. Um, and in the right here, I've, I've, which is, this is common, and the topic is actually defined by a, a list of words or phrases that are common to uh, different subsets of a document collection that you give. And in this case, the um, document collection consisted of all the documents across all the courses that we were studying and um, identified a, a number of topics um, through their keywords, which then I, as the analyst, gave a name to. So green IT energy, green IT with a focus on materials, optimization with a focus on sensors, optimization in the built world, optimization regarding land. Um, and um, these are the weights, uh, which is you know, some measure of the extent to which the topic is represented in the collection. Um, and in terms of these various topics, um, we just mapped out the um, characteristic topics um, for each of the courses. Um, so within a, co within a course, say Bryn Mawr, um, these 10 topic weights are going to sum to uh, one. So this represents the extent to which topic five, modeling of species, is represented in the Bryn Mawr course. Um, the average here is going to be 0.1. And so we just identified any topic with greater than uh, an average um, presence in the course is characteristic of that course. And you can see there's some interesting differences in the topics that are covered by these various computational sustainability courses. Um, at least I found them to be um, uh, interesting. Um, some courses are unique and they're really a, a coverage of a, um, uh, coverage of a, a topic. Uh, other topics are uh, uh, like topic two or somewhat common. Um, you know, and I think one thing that Carl and I and, and 
possibly Tom and others have talked about is a um, creating a, um, in fact, this seminar series, I think, is something of a predecessor um, to proceed a, um, a massive open online course or a self-paced course in computational sustainability that members of the um, CompSus Net might develop. And so uh, what should be in such a course? Um, uh, would it be seminar based or would it be based in some other way? So there's a lot of questions here, but the idea of, of a uh, online global course on computational sustainability, I think is, is quite attractive. Um, if you have thoughts on that, um, it's been something we've, I've been thinking about for a while and I think uh, others have too. Um, any thoughts on coverage? Uh, I'm essentially done. There's a, one other thing I want to talk about. Um, uh, I guess I'll just briefly mention it. Um, at a deeper, you know, that those computational sustainability courses are really um, what I would call course level integration into a curriculum, but um, it's possible to have deeper infusion. So can we infuse and introduce computational sustainability in an AI course where the intent is not to detract one bit of AI or take away one bit of AI from that AI course, but the exercises and projects are not looking at arbitrary um, uh, topics, but are looking at sustainability topics. Um, and uh, the idea is to um, introduce it in a way that's, um, uh, again, promotes sustainability without it being necessarily the focus, infusing it in the same way that the special tracks perhaps infuse uh, sustainability into the uh, conferences. So this is really sustainability at a deeper level. Uh, here's an example of an entry that you can find in the uh, wiki book, but as Carla said, we really want to add some more content here um, so that someone interested in, in talking about sustainability in the RIA course doesn't have to they can go to this um, go to this resource and find uh, find exercises or projects. Um, I was going to go through some, um, particulars of uh, CompSus Net, but uh, I think I'm simply going to stop because I think most people are aware of that. Um, I'll point out that CompSus Net is a big network within a uh, you know a village of networks, and um, I think as we get through most of the leadership for CompSus Net. Uh, it'd be nice to have a, uh, one of these uh, virtual seminars be a, a panel of leaders from other networks talking about, um, where we talk about uh, in a very interactive section, how CompSus Net fits into this, uh, this village of, uh, of networks. Both that seem very related like uh, Scrim at the very top, um, decision making and uh, climate um, change, and maybe some uh, others which are uh, less connected, but um, perhaps uh, might be uh, interesting, like the Center for E-Design. So I will, I will stop there, and um, if there's any other points of discussion, we can, we can talk about them. So, there is something in Q&A. Exactly. Sean McGregor asked, would it be appropriate to label computational sustainability uh, as computational solutions for the UN Sustainable <laughs> Development Goals? Where do they differ? <laughs> Are you... Um, uh, are you seeing, uh, if you go to Q&A, you can, you can see this question, would it be appropriate to label computational sustainability as computational solutions for the UN sustainability goals? And I would say yes. I, might, I think offhand it would be very appropriate. And um, I know this is something we've talked about. Um, I think it was Warren that challenged us to, um, maybe we should be speaking to policy. Um, and... Um, we talked about this uh, a couple months ago, uh, as I recall. So yes, I think uh, computational sustainability would 
speak to those development goals, I think um, a concern would be that um, within our ranks, we have people interested in, in doing that. Yeah, I, uh, may I interject, uh, Doug? Yeah, I, I actually think that's a beautiful question and it is an emphatic yes. In fact, you know, when we started computational sustainability, the big vision was exactly not to be limited and narrow to the, the notions of uh, sustainability. In particular, you know, we are talking 10 years ago and computer science would just think in terms of data centers or, you know, in a very narrow way. And we really wanted to, you know, uh, 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 look at sustainability very much aligned with the, the notion of sustainable development uh, as, as uh, outlined back in 87 by, by uh, the United Nations. So, you know, from the beginning, our vision, definitely my vision has been, you know, sustainability as uh, 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 equating it with sustainable development and therefore, you know, computational sustainability is really addressing the, the uh, sustainable development goals. There are 17 goals and indeed, and it's not just about the environment, in fact, you know, a lot of those goals really talk about poverty, hunger, uh, hunger, etc. And in the end, the big vision is really human well-being. So, so I, you, you know, I thought you, I really liked the question, and I personally s s think the answer is a, a huge yes. And and that's why you know uh, uh, these problems are so challenging because. You know, like we have a huge project, uh, you know, uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the Amazon, but we cannot just think about one uh, 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 aspect in isolation. We need to look at all these ecosystem service in terms of, you know, including issues such as, you know, cultural issues, etc. That's why sustainability and computational sustainability is challenging is how to address all these goals and uh, 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 aim to, you know, balance the, the different needs. So, so thank you for the question. I think it's really uh, 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 relevant and, and, uh, and I, I really like the way you, you framed it. And, and, uh, and Doug also is in complete agreement. So that's... Yes. All right. All right. Well, I well, think that's the last question. question. Well, thank you so much, Doug. This was a, a, a great talk, and I, you know, uh, uh, it's we, we, indeed you you formulated several challenge questions, and uh, we need to think about uh, issues, how to disseminate uh, what we are doing, education projects, subway lines, other representations. So, very good. Thank you so much, Doug. Bye-bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.